All right, welcome everybody to OT with DA. Today is day 15, we're in chapter 14. If I can move that like that, D. Yeah, there you better. go. You don't have to sit so close. I mean, you're welcome to come as close as you'd like. Yeah. Welcome everybody, my name is David Asherick. This is my good friend, D. Casper, uh, who's joining me for the third time now. Yep. For OT with DA, if you're wondering what that is, if you've just found this video and it's in your recommendations, basically we are reading through uh, a large portion of the Old Testament. It's a 75-day reading challenge. And uh, my name is David Ashrick, and so it's OT, Old Testament, with DA, David Ashrick. And occasionally I have guests. And in this case, my guest is... D. Casper. D. Casper. We're glad you're here, D. So welcome, everybody, to Instagram Live. Uh, I'll be interested to see if maybe we have fewer people tuned in tonight because people are watching football. Right? Is anybody watching the, the football game? It would be funny if somebody had like the football game over here and the <laughs> OT with DA would over here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hope you've had a wonderful Sunday. Uh, we've had a really beautiful Sunday here. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, D went for a walk in the woods right near our house. D, why don't you tell him what happened? <laughs> I don't want to. Come on, tell him tell I, him what happened. I got lost and your wife had to rescue me. Um, <laughs> I was like 1.7 miles the wrong direction. I ended up in some random person's front yard with, cat <laughs> with like cattle ranches in front of a horse trough. And then it was bad. I was on some nice subdivision street. I don't even know how I got there. And so uh, I had to swallow my pride and call his wife to see. <laughs> ah, I love it. Absolutely love it. And she did. So yeah, Dee just went for a, a walk today and ended up lost. But that which was lost is found. <laughs> Amen. Violet found you. You Rejoice came back to the house. You know, and like, then you went on another walk and you didn't get lost. Is that how it works? I, I, I got scared. I did the rowing machine instead. Oh, <laughs> so you didn't go on another walk. No, I will tomorrow. But it, last time when we did DA with DA, I lost my car. This time I lost myself. This isn't, is this, this isn't a thing good. with you losing things? I'd never lose things. I think it's like a... Maybe it's a me thing. Because I, I always lose things. I think that's it. It's contagious. I, 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 I lose my wallet. <laughs> on a weekly basis, I lose my keys on uh, a daily basis, just about. <laughs> I've lost many things. But anyway, Dee, we're so glad you're here. Uh, today, for me, was an absolutely wonderful day. I got up early and went rock climbing. I invited Dee to go, but I guess she just wanted to chill. Didn't want to go. I didn't. <laughs> okay, he's I not. I don't a... <laughs> know how to respond to this. <laughs> I'm not good at rock climbing, so... Yeah. Well, actually, there's a there's a local uh, if young you were man. Golfing, I would be there. Okay, fine, fine, fair enough. But there's a local young guy here who's a climber, and there's a really uh, lovely climbing area just like five minutes from my front door, and he's working on this very difficult route that I've climbed before, and uh, we call that in climbing uh, projecting. So when you're trying to do something that's at your very limit, sometimes it's good to have people that have done it before that can help you with the exact handholds and footholds and the sequences. And so he texted me and said, hey, would you mind coming and helping belay me? And he's a really lovely 29-year-old uh, engineer. Uh, his name is Alex. And we had a great time today. Got to tell him my story and, and my conversion. And really cool guy. He unfortunately didn't send the route, but uh, he said he'll be back on Friday. So he wondered if I could belay him again on Friday. And I said, of course. So that was my morning. And but when I came back, D, I think you had just been found. Yeah. Yeah, you'd been found. That which was lost was found. Had a great meal. And uh, today's yeah. been a wonderful day. But I will say, neither D nor myself, and correct me if I'm wrong here, D, neither of us are wild about this chapter. Yeah, there's some heavy parts in it. Yeah. Um, but but you're not like, yes! Yeah, it's not. Destruction of Sodom! Yeah, it's not as like gospel awesome as the last two chapters. Right. It's more of a solemn call to sobriety. D, you actually, you actually revealed a little secret that you hadn't told me before. You oh, told me just yesterday. Oh, dear. That you, these were not just serendipitous oh, days man. that you just happened to come. Tell the truth. D, uh, right now, confess to the uh, OT with DA audience. I wanted these chapters, so I gave them these <laughs> dates. It's true. You, you, went, you went in there and said, oh, where are the Abraham dates? I counted. He started today, which means it'll be in these chapters on this day, this day, and this day. I love it. And I'd really like to do those chapters. Plus, my schedule was actually free. Got it. So, Fair enough. Fair enough. But I like that. You you yeah. said to me yesterday, hey, just so you know, I... I have, uh, I have a confession. And I selected these days. Yes. So, anyway. For, for these chapters. Uh, and yesterday, this was one of those chapters, though. I will say that. You were excited about it. Th th this particular story in Scripture, I have exciting things on my heart okay. about it. Okay. All right. Yeah. 
I read through this chapter and we'll get into this in more detail, but this for me is, I, I don't think, woohoo, destruction of Sodom. This is gonna be really great to talk about. I do think that there's obviously important yeah. lessons in here for us. There are takeaways. There are a lot of, you know, very um, important modern day applications. And she spends like the latter third of the chapter on application. Yeah. Um, but it's a tough story, man. It's a hard story to read on many levels. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, we're gonna get into that. Welcome everybody to OT with DA. By the way, big apology. Um, yesterday when D and I finished, we found that the video for some reason, because we'd moved things around for the supplemental session, we hadn't plugged a cord in right or something. And so there was no audio on the video that we recorded yesterday. So we had to get audio from our backup source. Anyway, long story short, and then our good friend Jim synced it. So that's literally uploading right now. So a giant apology to those of you that were looking for the YouTube video. Um, it will be up in like 30 minutes. And then this video, by the grace of God, everything will go well. And it'll be up within about an hour of when this session is on, or about two hours actually. It takes us about an hour to do things and then an hour to upload. So anyway, apologies that that's not up. It wasn't because I went rock climbing. It was actually because there was a technical problem. That's yes. that's the truth. I'm telling the truth. I was there. And it was a technical problem that I couldn't fix. I didn't know how to do the syncing of the audio. So, okay, I'm off the hook. Whew, got that off my chest. Um, D, this is gonna be an experience. I am looking forward to moving through it. And I, I do have a few things I'd like to say. I know you've got some things you'd like to bring out. And uh, without further ado, let's pray and get into this uh, chapter, chapter 14, I think, the destruction of Sodom. So right. would you pray for us? Sure. Okay. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you for the chance to study. And uh, as happens in certain things that we read, it isn't always stuff that's super inspiring with the power of the gospel. There's also mm. convicting things yeah. that uh, cause us to look inward and to see if the things that trouble us in the text are living inside of us. Mm, and so on. I pray as we study tonight that you would speak to our hearts, that you would convict and challenge us, but you would also point us to the solution in Jesus. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you haven't already watched the conversation yesterday that I had with Dr. Anthony Bosman, the second supplemental session, you'll want to watch that. It was so fun, so informative, and a big shout out. Thank you, Anthony, for being willing to do it. If you haven't watched it, watch it and share it. I mean, you don't even have to be doing any part of OT with DA to share that with a family member, a friend, uh, an in-law that is maybe wondering about science, God, evolution. And next week's uh, supplemental session on Saturday is going to be a similarly mm -hmm. um, eye-opening, illuminating conversation about science, particularly evolution. We'll talk more about that later in the week, but go ahead and watch that and share it because I, I think it's a game-changing conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think it's exactly the kind of thing that would appeal to a mathematical, scientific, engineering type mind trying to get their mind wrapped around the, the gospel. So anyway, hope you watched that and enjoyed it. Um, so Dee, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start by reading um, maybe not all of Genesis 19, but I'm just going to read the opening bit. Is that all right? Yeah. Just to get us heading in a direction here. Set the context. So Genesis 19. So Genesis 18 has just happened. Abraham has had three visitors. Correct. Two of them leave. He barters back and forth with Jesus. That decision, that, that conversation closes. And now in chapter 19, those two visitors, those two angels make their way into Sodom. That's right. And, and, I love the fact that Dee just brought that out because if you don't follow Genesis 18 into 19, if you don't read those two together, you'll be a little bit confused. And I'm going to show you one of the most unusual verses in the whole book of Genesis today. It's in Genesis, it's in Genesis chapter 19. And the, the verse doesn't make any sense. Well, it does make some sense, but it makes even more sense when you realize that there were, as you just said, Dee, how many visitors that visited Abraham? Three. Three. And then two of them were these angelic figures that make their way to Sodom, and then who stayed back? Jesus. Jesus stays back, and, and they enter into that um, basically negotiation, yeah. right? This intercession, well, what if there were 50? What if there were 40? What if there yeah. were 30, 20, 10? And that apparently took a while. I mean, that, that process appears to have taken perhaps an hour or more, because when Jesus begins his walking journey to Sodom, he's significantly delayed. Right. And so that will actually become important a little bit later in the story. 
and I'm gonna show you one of the weirdest verses in the book of Genesis. It's in chapter 19, but I'm gonna start by just reading. Uh, I'm just gonna read like the first 11 verses. That'll get us heading in the right direction. So it says, now, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, right? So you just see it yeah. just picks up right from Genesis 18. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, now let's just remind ourselves, Lot is who? He's Abraham's nephew. nephew. He's like a son. He's he like was, a son. He was raised in his home when they left for Canaan land. He was raised with them. And Lot ends up in this direction because their herdsmen were quarreling. Correct. There's too much flocks, but not enough land. So Lot chooses the area towards Sodom because Abraham defers to him to choose. And that's why he's there. And and that was a magnanimous, you know, right. uh, that wasn't required by right. Abraham to do that. He right. He was actually assuming the position of the inferior right. when he occupied the superior in every, you know, sort of capacity. Right. And so Lot goes to Sodom. So anyway, this, we pick up yeah. right here. The two angels make their way to Sodom. So one, one more thing Go. For, for backdrop, just that um, that that city is sacked. So Lot was in the plain near Sodom originally. And then whenever Sodom is sacked and, and people are taken captive, that's kind of the warning shot for him. Correct. And I think it's a good context setter that this is the warning shot that I was in a place I really shouldn't have been, and God in his mercy saved me. Yeah. And yet, in Genesis 19, the dude is in the city. Yeah, that's right. His whole life is interwoven. He in just the keeps getting closer and closer. And entertainment and society. It, it, it's all interwoven now. So he's in even deeper than he was before, even though God gave him that warning shot, like the first seed to Jerusalem to get out. Right. He's there. So when D yeah. says that the city was sacked, that's a reference back to Genesis 14, yeah. where... When Abram arrives in Canaan, there's obviously already these sort of intertribal, interclan quarrels that are taking place, and Abraham gets kind of sucked up into it, and his nephew Lot gets kidnapped. Yeah. You, you'd like to think that Abraham would have just stayed aloof from all of that, but as soon as he heard that his nephew Lot was one of those that was taken, he gets involved. Yeah. And I love your point there, Dee, that if he would have been thinking more clearly, he would have thought, ah, you know, I think I'm going to back away from some of these lands that are right. already so hostile in their relationship to their neighbors, yeah. but he actually moves right into the city. Yeah, his kids are in the school system. He's he's deeply integrated into the society, his whole family. And is. we're gonna find it doesn't go well for him right. or his family because of that. That's okay, right. so back in 19.1, uh, here we go. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face to the ground. And he said, here now, my lords, Please turn into your servant's house and spend the night. Rise early and, and then go on your way. And they said, no, nah, no, nah, we'll just stay the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. It's a great time. They're having a meal. They're having a conversation. And then all of a sudden there's a troublesome knock at the door. Verse four, now before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded Lot's house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Hey, where, where are those men that came into you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them carnally. And uh, the word here is the Hebrew word yada, in the same way that Adam knew his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to know them carnally. Some translations just say we want to have sex with them. Right? right? That's, what's on, that's what's on offer here. So Lot uh, reads the situation. He's not unfamiliar with the citizens and the residents of of Sodom, of course, and so he goes out and tries to reason with them. Verse six, so Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him, trying to be discreet, so they went over here, because Lot doesn't understand the, right. the, the the nature of the guests that he's invited yeah. into his home. He just is, you know, being hospitable. And this is kind of an allusion to Abraham showing hospitality Very to much the men so. and not knowing who they were. Very much so. That, that, that aspect, and she will comment on this in a moment. We, we can come he to learned it. this hospitality he from, from Abraham. Abraham. Yeah. Um, so then verse nine, and you can even hear the language here, please, my brothers, right? That's the language of entreaty, right? Right. Please, my brothers, do not do so wickedly. Look now, I have two daughters and we'll talk about this because th it's even hard for me to read this yeah. troublesome passage. Look now, I have two daughters who have not known a man, virgins. Please let me bring them out to do and you out to you and you may do with them as you wish. Blah, 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 blah. What? Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason that they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in here to stay, and he keeps acting like a judge. 
Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. Just a word on that. You get the sense that Lot occupied a position of at least relative ethical, moral yeah. standing. Like This guy's like a, he's always acting like a judge, yeah. right? You get that sense that there's a backstory here, uh, but they're not having a bar of it, right? They're, they want these visitors. They want to know them carnally. And they are unmoved by Lot's overtures of, hey, take my daughters instead. Verse 10. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house. That's these men that are really angels. And they shut the door. By the way, there's a lot in the Bible about God shutting doors. Yeah. Yeah, There's a lot going on. The flood. The the flood. And then with Judas, he went out and shut the door. Uh, Verse 11. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great so that they became weary trying to find the door. Now, maybe we'll come back and read the rest of this, but basically the angels say, here's the deal. We're not just, you know, wayfarers. We're actually here on a mission to destroy this city. It's gonna be destroyed in the morning. So gather up your family and get out out right now. And then Lot's like, what? And and his response is kind of like, you know, you're probably right. Let me let me <laughs> let me schedule a moving truck. Exactly. And and and, and we'll do it. We'll do a thrift store. You know, give some stuff. We can have a garage little. sale. Yeah. yeah have yeah. a garage sale. And then eventually, and you don't understand. You're leaving right now. Correct. We don't have time for this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 hesitation of yeah. of Lot is a major part of the story. Oh, it's a major yes. part of the story. Absolutely. Okay. So D. Now I'm going to turn my attention to Genesis. Uh, excuse me. The Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 14. And let's just kind of go through this. And it's a long chapter. Yeah, super long. It's it's not a short chapter. And for my part, there's just a few things that I want to highlight in the actual story itself. And then a few points of practical application. And uh, anything that you want to add to that, great. Yeah. And we'll just sort of play off of one another. Sure. So on the first two pages there, types and symbols 190, 191, uh, anything pop out at you there? Just this idea that we've talked about, you know, I, I said in jest, you know, this idea that he went to a place where they have Whole Foods and a library system and good transportation and everything else. She says that with little thought or labor, every want of life could be supplied and the whole year seemed one round of festivity right. or ease. Right. And so that's why he chose the place for the ease that he would find. But there's a price for that as will be drawn out through the chapter. Yeah, these I just wrote down in my journal the words that she uses like in the opening three or four paragraphs. And here they are very quickly. Festivities, idleness, riches, wealth, leisure, sensual indulgence, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, riches, leisure, useless idle life, idleness, vice, crime, leisure, idle, mirth, revelry, feasting, drunkenness, violence. Yeah. You get the picture? Yeah. Right? They they have a lot of time on their hands. They're, this is an apparently very prosperous, tons of leisure time. And she uses that word. She's actually drawing from Ezekiel 16. Idleness, yes. idleness, idleness, idleness. And that, that's ripe ground for weeds to grow. And exactly. That's, and that's the point she makes in the next page, basically. And, and we should say that this idleness is set over and against God's Edenic ideal and his creational intent in the garden that labor, and we've already right. talked about this, labor and work is a blessing. Yeah. You know, we were made to make, we were, we were created to create and we are at our best as human beings, D, when we're doing stuff, yeah. when we're accomplishing things, when we're building things and painting things and writing things and, and organizing things and fixing things, human beings were made to do stuff. Right. And in contrast, like Abraham lived a simple life, but he lived a diligent life. Correct. And so he didn't have all the distractions and down. He was too busy caring for herds and doing other things mm. that he didn't have the opportunity to be idle. So... Being closer to conveniences also means there's less for you to be doing. Great point. Um, and so that that's... And and you yeah. run a school of, yeah. I mean, how many, you probably have like half a dozen or 13. a dozen. So you got 13 students in the school. You got staff. Yep. How many staff you got? Two staff in me. So Two staff. 16 total. Okay. So, and then you're also sort of affiliated there with the academy. So that right. probably adds administrative, you know, layers for you. I'm a part of a ministry called Light Bears. We have like, I don't know, approaching 20 employees and... Okay, Abraham's got a thousand people in his encampment, right? So he's not just a father and, uh, you know, a, a herdsman. He's a manager. Yeah. And so he's busy. And so while he's leading his quiet, pastoral, peaceful, patriarchal lifestyle, 
as you say, it doesn't mean he's not diligent. It doesn't mean he's not industrious. He's yeah. doing stuff. Yeah. But Lot is in the big city. Australians would call it the big smoke. <laughs> as they always say, if you were going to Sydney or going to Melbourne or Adelaide, they'd say, oh, you're going to the big smoke, right? The big town. Yeah. And so Lot's in the big smoke and people are chilling. They got a lot of idle time, leisure time, yeah. lots of prosperity. And that does not do well for human beings generally. That's not just an ancient reality. Right. That's that's today. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So anything else on that first page? Nope. I'm good. Um, okay. I'm going to turn the page too. Yeah. I'm going to kind of motivate through this. Now I do want to read a paragraph here, unless you were planning to read. It, it looks like you don't have it underlined. Uh, no, just the bottom of that page. Okay. So I'm on page 192 of Types and Symbols, and this is 158 of the uh, original pagination. I'm just going to read this paragraph because I think there's a really well written contrast, okay? Yeah. And this is uh, the paragraph that begins, and now the last night of Sodom was approaching. So she writes, and now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of vengeance cast their shadows over the devoted city, but men perceived it not. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other day that had come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of the declining sun. Right? You can see it, can't you? The coolness of eventide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. This sounds like, you know, no offense, it sounds like Miami Beach, <laughs> yeah. right? Or it sounds yeah. like, you know, the uh, Bay Area, or where I used to live, you know, Gold Coast, Australia, just... It's just a beautiful evening. The, yeah. the weather's nice. There's a, there's a nice, cool, crisp, you know, breeze blowing. And people are just out having a great time. And no one has any sense. Totally clueless. This is the yeah. last night. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. It is over. There's no warning at all for them. Yeah. Okay, now you had something in, on that same page as just well. The, yeah, just the next, at the bottom of the paragraph, the two strangers draw near the city gate. They get there. They're humble wayfarers. You can't really recognize them. Right. But it says there was one man, this is halfway down that bottom paragraph on 192 or 158 of the original. But there was one man who manifested kindly intention towards the strangers yeah. and he invited them to his home. Lot did not know their true character, just like what happened with right. Abraham before. Yeah. But politeness and hospitality were habitual with him. Mm. They were part of his religion. Lessons that he had learned from mm. the examples of Abraham. And this reminded me of something. I love it. Had he not, listen to this, she says, had he not cultivated a spirit of courtesy, he might have been left to perish with the rest of Sodom. Great point. And she made this powerful statement two chapters ago that once he saved them by prayer, or once he saved them with his sword, now he now saved them by save prayer. Them by prayer. Yeah. Now, I think the third way he saved them was by his example. Mm, the the I like third that. way, because she says that. Had he not oh, cultivated this point. spirit, he saved them by his example. Many a household and closing yeah. its doors against a stranger has shut out God's messengers who would have brought blessing and hope and peace. That's a great point. And Write so, that down. Write that yeah. down in your notes. So let's think about this. The three ways that Abraham and his influence effectively saved Lot. Number one, by the sword when by he rescued sword. him from the kidnapping in Genesis 14. Number two, by his the prayers. intercession there yeah. at the end of Genesis 18. And then now by his example. Example. That's yeah. great, D. Great yeah. insight. Absolutely love that. And for anyone in a situation, for people you love and care about that are wayward, these are three ways that they can be softened and reached. Sometimes you got to get in there and get your hands messy right. and do something. Sometimes you got to pull out the sword, man. <laughs> well, maybe not that, <laughs> but sometimes you got to get in there and get busy right. in different ways. Other ways, you can't do anything but pray. And in other ways, the example you gave them will eventually lead them back home. Beautiful. They know where home is because of the example that you gave them. Excellent. Um, I underlined a lot of the next paragraph. I did too. But, but it's a lot of simple principles of just not living for yourself, basically, is the main point yeah. that she's making. I wrote at the top of uh, page 193, that, well, this is one of my favorite Thomas Aquinas quotes, and he says simply, to, to love is to will the good of another. Mm. Yeah, that's that's so that's such a succinct and thoroughly biblical definition of love. To love someone is to will their good, yeah. right? Not just to hope for it, not just to intend for it, but to will it. Yeah, right. And so there's a that's a great great chapter. I actually yeah. wrote in the in the margin there, beautiful next to this sentence: the little attentions, yeah. the small simple courtesies go far to make up the sum of life's happiness. And the neglect of these constitute no small share of human wretchedness. Yeah, the small things are big things in God's eyes. Right. Yeah, for sure. Now, 
I, she's painting Lot here in a positive light in the sense that he has adopted at least some of the pattern and example of his uncle, father-like figure, yeah. Abraham. But I think as the, as the picture emerges and as the story emerges, in, including in the rest of Genesis 19, which we've not read, at this point, I'm going to say it this way, Lot is not a decidedly righteous man living in an extremely wicked city. Right. He's a barely savable man living in a really wicked city. She'll comment later that he was saved so as by fire, basically Correct. barely. This guy, is, so he's he had, on his way out. He's, he's a man who is trying to live a righteous life while being comfortable in the presence of foolishness. Correct. And it doesn't work at the end of the day. Like you may barely get through, but what, what legacy do you leave to the world? It's, it's ugly. Um, yeah. So the next paragraph, she says, seeing the abuse to which strangers were exposed in Sodom, Lot made it one of his duties to guard, at, guard them at their entrance by offering them accommodations at his own home. The thing is, he knows how bad this place is. Yeah, this is the point. Yeah, the, the, like the, you know how bad it is, and you're choosing to live there. That's right. Like so, well, it's my ministry to try to say, but yeah, but like, how did your what are you doing help, there? How did your ministry help your family? Yeah, and, and, and we'll get to that later at the right, end. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, yeah. and this is a great lesson, just a simple practical lesson that we yeah. sometimes place ourselves in situations where we're not. This is what I, I've told my sons this over and over again. They've heard me tell them this a thousand times. Listen, in your relationships with people who are not active followers of Jesus Christ, um, influence is flowing either to you or from you. Yeah. It's never just this equilibrium state where it's perfectly static and you can just hang out. No, 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 no. When you're hanging out with unbelievers, which is fine. I have no problem with that. But you have to be mindful. And I've been telling my boys this. You know, you're either a thermometer or a thermostat. You're either yeah. reflecting the ambient temperature like a thermometer or you're setting the ambient mm -hmm. temperature like a thermostat. Influence is either flowing from you or to you. And Lot is operating under the delusion that a lot of Christians today operate under. And that is that they can just easily, freely, casually associate with people for whom Jesus is not their Lord, which is, by the way, totally fine, as long as... There's evangelistic intentionality yeah. or there's genuine, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be expressly religious influence flowing from you, but it should at least be kindness, love, and, selflessness, and hospitality, it should be moral. Right. But just to think, oh, I'm going to hang out with these people because I enjoy it. And okay, to a degree. And then at some point you're either salting or being salted right. and lots operating under the illusion that he's salting when in fact he's being salted and we're going to see that right he's being salted and so he sort of fancies himself like oh i'm going to protect these men from the you know these travelers from the men of the city what are you doing in the city right and why are you raising your family there exactly and we're going to get to that you have yeah. children yeah. here get out yeah. this is our point like yeah. like he is not an abraham like figure no. dwelling in you know moral uh righteousness and you know he's not an up he's a totally different kind of person and barely, barely distinguishable in my strong opinion mm. from the men of Sodom. And that's actually evidence in something we've already read, which we'll get to in just a second. So she, she closes on page 193. He'd hoped to conceal his intention. Of, so he's trying to get these guys out of mm -hmm, here without causing mm -hmm. a scene. But she says that their hesitation and delay and his persistent urging is what brought attention right. to them. But this idea he of takes this circuitous route because right. he knows where he's living. Right. So hesitation and delay shows up in a lot of different contexts yeah, good in this point. chapter. Um, then so gets him back to the house. They get to the house. They have that conversation, and then the men strike the men of the the angel strike the men of the city with blindness. And but it says right after that that the men, after they receive a judgment from God, weary themselves trying to find the door. And this tells me something <laughs> that first of all, miracles don't change people's condition. Yeah, no, that's true. Absolutely like, true. Even encountering a divine judgment from God did not change their disposition. Mm. They didn't say, oh, Lot, please pray for us. We're so sorry. They still wearied themselves trying to find the door, and she even yeah, says A that. good contrast there, by the way, yeah. would be Saul of Tarsus, right? Exactly. He's smitten with blindness, and he immediately goes into repentance, right. contrition, you know, self-loathing. Right. And, you know, this is not what's happening in this situation. Yeah. And Ella White calls this double blindness. Yeah, I thought that was Being given up to the hardness of heart. Double blindness. And because the blindness of the eyes and the blindness of the heart. That's right. All that the blindness of the eyes is doing is reflecting the blindness of the heart. That's right. 
And so then she makes a statement. This is a one, two, it's a big second paragraph on 194. In right at symbols. the bottom. Yeah, kind of towards the middle bottom of it. She says that last night was one of the last sentences of that paragraph. That last night was marked by no greater sins than many others before it. Right. But mercy so long slighted had at last ceased its pleading. The inhabitants had passed of Sodom had passed the limits of divine forbearance. Then she quotes someone. I don't know who it is, but what divine forbearance is, and she calls it the hit, or they call it the, the hidden, hidden boundary, boundary between God's patience and His wrath. Fascinating. Which that was really, really poetic and. By the way, I've already selected as one of my words and one of my sort of arbitrary um, <laughs> rules that I establish in my OT with DA reading challenge or the DA with DA reading challenges that I try not to use the same word twice. So I've already used the word limit. But if I hadn't already used the word limit, limit would be a very good yeah. word for this chapter yeah. because she uses the word several times in describing the fact that Sodom generally and these people specifically had passed the, how does she say it? the limits of divine forbearance or, yeah. di or divine patience. Yeah. And just to state the obvious here, or to state maybe what's not obvious, but to state what has already emerged from our reading up to this point, this is not an arbitrary line that God just draws in the sand. Right. This is, and I'll show you this, a really cool passage to this effect in this chapter. This is the people placing themselves irretrievably. She That's actually right. uses that word. Yeah. Irretrievably outside of God's offers of, she says it over and over again, his offers of grace, his offers of mercy, his pleadings. Yeah. So this isn't something that God is arbitrarily foisting upon them. He's honoring the line they've drawn. Exactly. He's not drawing a line capriciously. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, a, it's so important to maintain that distinction because she's already mentioned several times in the past about God's infinite compassion and right. his, his infinite mercy. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. There's plenty of capacity in God but if you're not availing yourself, it's like you can have a local grocery store that's just filled to the brim with food and groceries and all kinds of wares. But if you never go to the grocery store, you can still starve. Right. And that's not a reflection on the fact that there's not food to be eaten, that you are not going there. You're not availing yourself of what's, of what's available to you. And that's what's happening here. And this blindness, as with Saul of Tarsus, could have been an opportunity for them to repent and be like, whoa, these are supernatural guests but they're so inflamed with passion and they're so accustomed to being the rulers of the night and the rulers of their city that they just think they're gonna get their way, damn the consequences, damn yeah. the torpedoes, and this is that double blindness that she talks about. And it's interesting that Lot was a dim light, but at least he was a light in that environment. A very dim light. But he was still a light of some sort, and that yeah. was an act of God's mercy that he was there as some, because they'd say, this guy keeps standing as a judge against yeah. us. So and he could have, could have been self righteousness though, D. Well, she says that though. The point is, she still refers to him as a righteous witness in this place, even though he's not all of what he could have been. I'm not. No, I'm no, not no I'm with he was you. I, I, okay, let me just get. Let I'm me... just saying that's an act of God's mercy that any form of light is Fair in enough. this place. Fair enough. And that can't be ignored because we're talking about the fact that there's a line here. Yeah. God's mercy was evident even in the dim light. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. And God's mercy can be evident in the rain and in right. the sun and in right. the you know the beautiful even tide right. light that she's describing. But I will say something very interesting about this is that you, you notice that I mentioned when I read through Genesis uh, 19 there, and I got to the part where Lot just like volunteers his virgin daughters to this ravenous mob. Yeah. And, and Ellen White, doesn't she doesn't say a word about it. She yeah. literally not one syllable, and I wrote in my margin, she just says, the events that followed, the events that followed, and here's what I wrote in my margin. She can't even bring herself to tell the tale of him offering his daughters. Yeah. It's so repulsive. It's inexcusable. It's inexcusable. Now, yeah. I, I know that some of you might be inclined to say, oh, no, 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 because he knows, Lot knows that if he offers his daughters, they're interested in, you know, gang raping the men. And so he knows that, no, sorry, the guy does not get a pass. Yeah. There is no sense in which Middle Eastern hospitality or Middle East protection of those that you brought on your roof requires you to offer your own children to a raging mob. It's insane. Right. But what it shows is that his own mind had become perverted. He had, yeah. the window has shifted. And even though he is a light, a dim light. She also makes that point super clear that his mind was exactly. totally shifted and corrupted by the place. Exactly. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. Peter is going to make the point in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, that, yeah. that his, his soul, his righteous soul was vexed. Yeah, someone just quoted it here. Uh, oh, you can scroll That's down. Sylvia, yeah. 
So th- exactly, Sylvia, that Saul's righteous soul was vexed day by day by the unlawful deeds. In other words, he was being salted. He was being influenced. And this happens to all of us. This is not just something that is proprietarily, you know, ancient and belongs to Lot. If we place ourselves under the influence of gun- ungodly, sensual, uh, unchristian, you know, unfaithful influences, don't think that that influence is not flowing to you. It is. Right. Right, just like water flows downhill, it's flowing to you. And Lot here appears to imagine himself as occupying some status of moral high ground, when in reality, he's just moving with the tide. You've heard the yeah. saying that all ships rise with the tide. Okay, that's true. But, but all people are influenced by the prevailing culture, unless, like Abraham, you are purposefully, volitionally, and intentionally resisting by, for example, not living in that city. Yeah. If you, have you ever heard this? It's a great old tale. I love this. I heard Dwight Nelson tell this years ago. And it's a, it's a story about a man who was living uh, near a very unrighteous city. We can imagine it was Lot, or a Lot-like person. It was an unrighteous city, and every day this man would travel from a, a little house that he had not far from the city, and he would come to the gate of the city, and he would preach against it. Have you heard this story? It's mm-hmm. great. He would preach against the city, and he would preach against its sins, and he would preach against its sensuality, and he would preach against its indolence, and he would preach, preach, preach. And every day, every day, he would stand at the gate, and he would preach against the city. And, and one day, one of the residents of the city came to him and said, man, you're wasting your time. You're, you're, wa- what are you, you're out here every day. You're preaching every day. You're saying a lot of the same things every day. You are totally wasting your time. None of these people are going to change their mind. And the man said, oh, you misunderstand. I'm not preaching to change their mind. I'm not preaching to change them. I'm preaching so they won't change me. Mm -hmm. I'm preaching so they won't change me. Lot is not occupying that role. He's not. He's just not. There's dissonance in the statements that are made in a positive light for him. Mm. And I think, again, those seeds of Abraham's example were the only thing that kept him from fully being swallowed up by this environment. I mean, clearly there's enough residual opportunity and light in him that God says, well, we'll save him. We'll make every effort. But even then, when he comes out of the city, what does he say? Uh, man, I can't dwell in the country like my uncle Abraham. Let me go to the city Zoar, this yeah. tiny... And you can just feel Jesus shaking his oh, head in unbelief and it's, incredulity. Like, yeah, it's, it's blood curdling. It's bad. You know what I wrote in my yeah. margin? I wrote, God honors even our poor decisions. Yeah, he gets... He's like, okay, all yeah. right, you know... You didn't learn it when you got kidnapped. Yeah. You're not learning it right now when the city's about ready to be destroyed. Your wife was just turned into a pillar of salt, but, you know, okay. Have your own way. And then actually, as, as Genesis 19 closes, the guy ends up in a cave. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get there in just a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Okay. All that's to come. So the bottom of that page, 194, she just makes an interesting statement. The strangers whom Lot had endeavored to protect now promised to protect him. And he fought them hoof and claw. Right. Unfortunately. So... Now, so he gets to his sons-in-law. He knocks on the, you know, they tell him, get your family. He goes to his sons-in-law and they think he's joking. Right. And I wrestled with that. And you think, well, why is that? And it dawned on me, hmm. the inconsistency. So imagine this guy who's been having family reunions. Hmm. You come over to his house. He goes to your house. There's never a word of complaint, seemingly. There's right. never. And so all of a sudden, you guys got to go, get, get out of here. Out of it's here. so bad. This place is so wicked. It's going to be destroyed destroy tonight. It. It's so bad. It's so and terrible. Like, Are you kidding? You need to get out. We have tickets to the concert tomorrow no, night. No, that's not my point. So what I'm saying is, right. in that scenario, they're incredulous because you didn't seem to be that worried yesterday. Yeah, that's my point. I'm saying, they're yeah. saying, what do you mean leave tonight? Lot, we're all, the whole family's going to the right. concert tomorrow night. And then so, we got tickets to the game. Right. And no, so, we're not going anywhere. So you weren't that worried yesterday. You certainly can't be serious. Yeah, what what changed? So his sense of a lack of urgency this entire time has led them to think you're basically just joking. Right. And and Ellen White goes so far as to say his daughters were influenced by their husbands and they were well enough off where they were. They could see no evidence of danger and everything was just as it had been. They're not leaving. Mm. Right? It's just not it's not gonna work. This is so, another great case to be made for. Deter- who you marry is very often right. a determiner of your lifelong right. happiness and even your destiny. Yeah. It's, it's a big decision. And the fact that a place like this would be destroyed was impossible to them. And so he goes home sorrowful, right? She says, which is so sad. And so then he tells his wife, it's time, you need to tell your wife it's time to go. But then this thing keeps showing up. Lot delayed. This is right. 195, the second paragraph. Correct. 
and though daily distressed at beholding the deeds of violence, he had no true conception of the debasing and abominable iniquity practiced in that vile Correct. city. Correct. So I'm like mildly uncomfortable, but not uncomfortable enough to leave. Right. And this is this is something that should be really stirring to us. Like, Amen. are there things that like, oh, no, 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 I would never do that. But I totally watch it on Netflix and it doesn't bother right. me. Right, totally agree. Right, like just this, this, this sense is the of point Paul makes when Paul comes to the very end of Romans, that catalog of sins in Romans uh, 1, 18 to 31. At the end, he says, and, and there's people that not only um, do these things, there's other people that just enjoy yeah. that people do these things. Well, that's yeah. television. Yeah. I mean, obviously television didn't exist in the days of Paul, but yeah. we sometimes as Christians are entertained by things that we know are disgusting, repulsive, and sinful, and that we ourselves would be mortified by if they actually happen in real life. Right. So we say, well, no, 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 we don't want to do the real life thing. But it, man, it makes for great entertainment. Yeah, That's, I'm not so sure. Yeah. And by beholding, you become changed. I'm just not so sure. Do I really want to take delight in the things that kill Jesus, right? And find them entertaining. 100% so, correct. Um, at the bottom of that paragraph, it was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life to go forth a destitute wanderer. <laughs> stupefied with sorrow, he lingered, yeah. loath to despair, or loath to depart, sorry. But for the angels of God, they all would have perished. Yeah. They had to take him by the hand and yank him out of here. And the thing that I wrote in my journal here was that he has, he's struggling so hard to walk away from a life he never should have had in the first place. Correct. What made this so Man, difficult. Man, that's just like the devil with the deceitfulness of sin. It is. You, you, we're fighting so hard to not want to, to leave something. To keep the thing that will kill us. That we were never supposed to have in the first place. Mercy. And so at the end of the page 195 of Types and Symbols 160, hesitancy or delay now would be fatal. And to cast one lingering look would be, and it was for his wife, um, this storm of divine judgment. And so it's all, it's just, it's just. You read the horrifying. line there, stupefied with sorrow. On yeah. the next page, she says, Lot confused and terrified. I mean, the yeah. guy, you, it's He's hard not to feel a little sorry for him. Yeah. His whole world is collapsing around him. The city that he thought, well, yeah, you know, they're not where, where I'm at. And yeah, they're sinful in some quarters, but no, they're okay. You know, there's some good mm -hmm. people here. Um, no, actually, the city's going to be destroyed tonight. His house is going to be lost. His, you know, accumulated wealth is going to be lost. Some of his family is going to be lost. And he's just totally, he's stupefied. This is how people are going to be at the end of time. They're going to realize that all of this was for naught. It was for yeah. nothing. And that all of the leisure and wealth and mirth and festivity ultimately adds up to nothing. This is the danger of syncretism, that you're trying to be a Christian while living by the principles of the world. You're trying to succeed in the Christian experience while using the infrastructure of a different belief system. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and this, is, this is the warning to us that are we trying to live a Bible-believing life while being so comfortable and deeply embedded in an unbiblical worldview. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah. those warring things really cause confusion and difficulty. Um, and I got a couple things here. Yeah, go for it. So middle of page 197, I just want to highlight that this is language that we've seen before, and it's really great language. Right in the middle of page 197, 162 of the original, Christ has paid an infinite price for our salvation. Underline it, mark yeah. it, highlight it, believe it. And then she continues, and no one who appreciates the value of this great sacrifice or the worth of the soul will despise God's offered mercy. And this is where she starts making the point over and over again about God's offers of mercy, his overtures of mercy, his offers of love and of salvation, of which the invitation to Lot and his family is, is a, right. an illustration. Yeah. And so that yeah. language is great. She's been using that language of infinite yeah. with regards to infinite sacrifice, infinite price, infinite mercy over and over again, and I love yeah. it. One point on 196 is just this idea of his hesitancy leads to his wife being lost, and she felt so wronged and offended that God would ask such a thing and take all of what she'd worked so hard for. And I think that that, that needs to be acknowledged that when we find ourselves in those spaces, yeah. it's not because God did something wrong. It's because we're somewhere we never should have been. Correct. And what, what's so heartbreaking to me is that Abraham prayed his guts out for this guy to be saved, and he's fighting the very means of God saving him. He's living on borrowed time with no appreciation for that fact. And, and so is his wife because of his example and his hesitancy. And I think that can't be overlooked. It's because he, he still imagines himself to be occupying a status that he no longer has. This is what yes. happens to us. Yes. We get we move with the shifting ebbs and tides of the world and of culture and of society. 
And I mean, I could literally give dozens of examples of this, which is why it's so essential that we are moored to the text of Scripture, right? Like, if we move to the left or to the right, morally or politically or ethically, we think, oh, no, I'm fine. Because look, I'm equidistant from the people on the right, and I'm equidistant from the people on the left. And a lot of Christians will take this sort of, well, we have to be balanced. Yeah. We have to be moderate. No, 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 no. We don't have to be balanced in that regard. We have to be faithful. Yeah. If, if you find you're mooring by staying equally distant from the extreme right and the extreme left, well, what are you going to do when the whole window shifts? Yeah. Right? Sometimes you get out in the ocean, and I, I know this because I've spent a lot of time in the ocean. Sometimes you're out in the ocean, and you think, oh, I'm just like in a bathtub. I'm just floating around like a little rubber ducky. Oh, no. There are currents, yeah. whole currents that are moving, you know, the size of football fields, rivers that are flowing through the ocean, and you can feel like, no, I'm fine, I'm just fine. Yeah, everybody's moving. You know, I'm sitting right next to that guy, and I'm between that surfer, and the kayak is right there. Yeah, you all have just moved half a kilometer, you know, south. And I've been caught in a, I almost died in a riptide with Jennifer Schwerzer. It's an incredible story, and she almost died, and I rescued her, and then I almost died. It was a nightmare story. We both had to be rescued. And what can happen is you can feel totally safe, and then everything starts moving, and so you can't I, if I gauge off of Jennifer, we're both moving, mm -hmm. right? And so what Lot is doing is he's gauging off of the other people in his city and in his surroundings, and he thinks he's fine, which is why it's so crucial that Abraham purposefully, intentionally detached yes. himself, and so he wasn't receiving those sometimes undetected influences that are just moving you all around. Yeah. And don't we see this today, D, with the way yeah. that people are just so Christian people, people who should know better, just so politically charged and politically yeah. enraged and politically engaged. And I'm thinking, these politicians are not your savior. They can't yeah. do anything to save you. And I'm not suggesting that there's not, you know, some situations and circumstances in which we could be politically involved, especially for, you know, issues upon right. which scripture speaks plainly. But to orient yourself relative to the larger political or social climate is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. It's, and that's what that's what Lot does here. And it distorts your way of viewing reality. It's so gnarly Correct. and so nasty. And again, that's another form of syncretism, that you're trying to be a Bible-believing Christian, but the principles you're living by are largely politically based. Right. Because you're watching this news station with their agenda or the other guys and their agenda, and then you're putting people in boxes. You're with us or you're against us. You Correct. can't think rationally, intelligently, and graciously Ooh. when you're in this soup. And that's... That's yeah. the danger. It's classic in-group, out-group And I think a lot of it comes out of arrogance. I can handle it. Right. Lot thought that he could handle being in this place, Correct. and that's what that's got him in trouble. Point. I've got a devotional life. My grandfather, you know, my uncle's a praying man. I can handle this. And what he reaped is the whirlwind. Correct. And I think this sense of arrogance that we think that we can handle certain situations is the slide that leads us to these dark places. And, and it corrupts everyone that we're trying to lead in that environment. It's a kind of spiritual arrogance. Yeah. I know I've already quoted it, but just write down 2 Peter 2, 6 to 8, because Peter says expressly that, that the righteous soul of Lot was vexed. It was bothered. It was annoyed. It was tormented. She says day, or Peter says yeah. day by day. In other words, when Lot moved into Sodom, it didn't happen overnight. Right. No, 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 no. It happened incrementally progressively, day by day, a little accommodation here, a little compromise here, a little tolerance here, a little acquiescence here. And again, the whole thing is shifted, but you are still, and this is a great point you make, Dee, you're still convincing yourself that you're the person right. that moved here a year ago. No, you're not. No. You're not that person anymore. No. It reminds me of that great statement that I've quoted Matt Parra, a dear, a dear oh, friend of both that. of ours. You know, he just said, you... The, the decisions that you make today create the person that you will be tomorrow, and you have no guarantee yeah. that the person that you will be tomorrow will, will be even, capable yes. of recognize or, recognizing or making the moral choices that you face today. Yeah. You, you don't just get to you know, drive a stake in the ground and then let yourself be drawn hither and yon and then think, no, I can just always revert back to the person that I was you know, a month ago, a year ago, or a decade ago. No. You're making decisions today, in the words of C.S. Lewis, every time we make a choice, we're changing the central part of that, yeah. of who we are, into something a little different. In fact, Lewis says, every decision that we make is either turning us incrementally into a heavenly creature or, or a, a hellish, hellish creature, yeah. right? And so you don't just get the luxury to move into a town, stay there for a year, make all of these compromises and acquiescence, acquiescences to the prevailing culture, and then think, oh no, I'm still that same person. Yeah. 
but he thought he was. Right. And you can't keep banking on previous victories. Like you have to continually be abiding and trusting yes. and yielding and surrendering. Not that, oh, I made that surrender five years ago and that's all that matters. Like this guy lost sight of his utter dependence for a daily need to draw from that well. I got something at the bottom of page 198. Go for it. Okay, this is amazing. Right at the very bottom oh, yeah. of page 198, it's also, uh, this is 165 of the original. I, I mentioned this earlier that I would say this. So she quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. She, this, this whole chapter is just bathed in scripture. Yeah. So she quotes Malachi 3, 7. Return to me and I will return to you. Now listen to this. But if the erring one persistently refuses, underline that, mm. persistently refuses to heed the voice that calls him. How does that voice call us? With pitying, tender love. Mm. Now watch this. Watch this. This is so key. He will at last be left in darkness. Yeah. Now do this. Underline the word left, draw a little arrow, and write not placed. Mm. Okay, let me just tell you what I mean by that. She doesn't say, but if the erring one persistently refuses to heed the voice that calls him with pitying, tendering love, he will at last be placed in darkness. Right. No. God doesn't place any of the people in Sodom. He doesn't place Lot and his family in Sodom in darkness. Right. What he does is, is he gives them one last invitation to get out of yeah. darkness. And if we refuse to come out, then he leaves us there. He gives us the desires of our heart. He gives us the desires of Even our heart. Even if it isn't him. Even if it's the thing that's going to kill us. That's right. And I just can't emphasize yeah. that point enough. They are left in darkness. Yeah. God doesn't pluck them up from an otherwise prosperous situation that's conducive to her human flourishing and then drop them into darkness. He says, no, 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 you need to get out. Yeah. No, no, this place is going to be destroyed. And of course, the whole earth and the principles, the lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life by which the earth operates is going to be destroyed. And all of this is an invitation to us to not moor ourselves mm -hmm. to this world and its ways, but to moor ourselves to scripture and to God and his love. Yeah. And if we choose not to receive that pitying, tender love, the invitations of pitying, tender love, then we will ultimately be left yeah. in the darkness that we have chosen. Yeah. Huge. And, and this happens throughout the Old Testament. Like, you know, I turned them over to the desires of their heart or I gave them over to mm. this idea that God didn't create it or put them in that place. He gives them what they want. Correct. Yeah. And let me just say more, one more word about that. She then makes the point, middle of page 200, 167 of the original, she says, there was a coming out, mm. right? And the paragraph begins, there was a coming out. Listen to this. There was a coming out, a decided separation from the wicked, an escape for life. So it was in the days of Noah, mm -hmm. so with Lot, so with the disciples prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, and so it will be in the last days. And she actually goes on to quote Revelation 17 and 18, right. um, come out of her, my people. That's right. Again, the voice of God is heard in a message of warning, bidding his people separate themselves from the prevailing iniquity. And I love all of what she says here. The only mild critique I have is that she misses the most important and most formative get out in the whole of Scripture, which is how this whole narrative begins. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, get out of your country and from your father's... That is the beginning of all of the subsequent get outs. All the movements come from a removing correct. of one place and going to something correct. else. The remnant comes correct, out of the wilderness. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. God is always right. calling us out, out and away from something and into something. And the thing he's calling us into is himself. He's calling yeah. us to himself. Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will right. give you rest. And so, by the way, you might just want to write in the margin there, get out. Yeah. Get out. In fact, I wrote it huge in my journal. Look at that. Get out. <laughs> Get out. And if we took the time right now, D, between us and the people on Instagram Live, we could come up with at least a dozen examples in Scripture where the overriding message and narrative from God to his people is get out. Yeah. We could come up with a dozen right now. Yeah. And that whole motif, I mean, we have a book named after it, Exodus. Exit. Right. Get out. God's invitation to us is not always just to get out of a place geographically, but to be getting out of unsafe places spiritually, and unsafe places morally. Yeah, and go that, ahead. That's the problem that happens with his children. Mm. Was that they had, and I mean, people say this all the time, but it's true that 
He had gotten his daughters out of Sodom, but he hadn't gotten Sodom out of his daughters. Yeah, I almost wrote idea. a book years ago called Babylon Come Out of My People, but I just never wrote it. <laughs> it's, so, it's true, though. In, in this circumstance, you know, like you see the idea that they have. Like, so he, he's, he's arguing back and forth, and he's, like, he's telling the Lord of glory, I'm going to die if I do what you say. Mm. Like he's, God, <laughs> he's telling him, get out of this city, and his response is, I'll die if that happens. <laughs> And he's like, you'll die if you don't. Yeah, and this this is what sin does to us. It right. makes us stupid. If you don't get out, and if you don't get that out of you, this is how you think. Correct. And so You're he says, exactly correct. I'm, I'm going to die if that happens. And so then he barters with him and says, let me go to this other city. But then the other city, as soon as the fires start to fall, he leaves that one anyway. Right. And goes up to the mountain. Ends up in a cave. And the brilliant idea his daughters have is, well, let's look at the text. Look at what the daughters actually say. They say, and I hate this part of the story, I, but I got to say it. Yeah, say it. Chapter 19, uh, it says, where is this? Are you trying to, uh, here it they, is, here they it is, verse 31. They say, our father is old and there is no man on the earth to come into us as is the custom of all the earth. Is that even true? There's not a single human being. And here's the problem. Well, they're living in a cave. I mean, they're totally isolated. He's but, probably a completely broken man. His wife's a pillar of salt out on the <laughs> plane and he's probably just drinking his life away. I mean, clearly drinking is a part of what's going on in that cave because they come up with this great idea. Let's get our father drunk. Well, it didn't come from alcohol. It came from the school system that dad put them in. That's right. my point. Fair point. And so they're in this situation where their brilliant idea is the only way in which we can have a lineage is not to look for godly dudes on this earth. And those Ooh. people existed. They had no desire for godly men I'm So glad you're because this of where dad sent them to be educated. Yeah. Fair point. And so that's the thing that's so concerning to me. And the response is, uh, all right, brilliant idea. Let's get dad drunk and you sleep with them. And then I'll get dad drunk and I'll sleep with them. And this is all because dad put down roots in a place that God never called Correct. him. Correct. There's always a cost for this. Even if you've got a devotional life and you think you can handle it, there is always Doesn't a cost. Doesn't mean your kids can handle it. Yeah. And they clearly couldn't. Because this is what's left. And what LOI basically comments on this is what he left to the world was a stench of an inheritance. They Correct. were people who were a continual thorn in the side of the nation of Israel. The Moabites and the Ammonites. Yeah, it was a mess. So, so, so yeah. just a word on that. One of the, one of the narratives in Genesis 19, and uh, Richard Davidson in, in his book, Claim of Yahweh, makes this point. That at the beginning, just listen carefully to this. This is very interesting. At the beginning of the story, um, when when the ravenous mob is, uh, the hostile mob is coming to try and take yeah. the two strangers, what does Lot do? Lot offers to make his daughters effectively victims. He, he places them into a dangerous situation. And again, I don't buy for a second that he knew it wasn't dangerous. No way. Right. Yeah, people will, people that are inflamed by passion will take whatever they want. They didn't in this case, right. but... That just was the grace of God, right? They easily could have. But here's the point. Don't miss this. That's how the story sort of launches there, where, 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 or not that story, but this element of the story, where Lot puts his daughters out there and his daughters see this example. They see, oh, I guess, you know, sexual mores are all in flux now. I mean, they'd been salted by the people of Sodom and they'd, they'd taken on board some of that perversity and that sensuality. They've completely lost their Edenic moorings, the creational intent that God had for humankind in terms of sexuality. We've already talked about that at length with Jen. So how does the story end? The story ends by Lot's two daughters victimizing him. Yeah. Right? They sexually. get him yeah. drunk. They get him drunk and then lie with him sexually. They effectively take advantage of the man who had taken advantage of them. Where did they learn this behavior to sexually exploit? Yeah. Right to to let your sexual mores be so perverse and so ridiculous and so disgusting. They learned that from their dad and from Sodom. Yeah, and so we've ha we've heard this saying before that hurt people hurt people. Yeah, that's true. It's absolutely true. And they are here tragically and terribly actually following in line with the pattern and example set by their father of placing people into sexually vulnerable and exploitative positions. And then it results in Moab and Ammon being born that she makes the point, went on to become vile and perverse peoples themselves. Well, why not? The epigenetic and cultural influences of the, you get off to a bad start and it's not impossible, but it can be very difficult to right the ship. 
And he's already lost two so daughters sad. to this tie. It's so sad. So he he lost two already. They've married ungodly guys who are laughing a lot's face, and for good reasons. And the only two he has left, Mercy. the only hope he has left of changing course, and he can't. Yeah, I don't know what how you picture this, Steve, but in my mind's I I just see a completely broken, unshaven, unkempt, slovenly man, you know, drinking his cares away in some remote cave. And you know, gonna you know, his life is just gonna whittle away into nothing, filled with regrets, filled with brokenness, filled with sadness, and longings for what might have been. And his daughters see this, and they're like, "Man, our dad's gonna die, and there's not gonna be anybody yeah. left on earth to continue his line." And so they resort to the most unfortunate and grotesque of plans. And here again, the Bible is not advising. Obviously, yeah. it's not recommending. What it's showing us, and we're going to see this a lot in the Old Testament, is that when we depart from God's Edenic ideal, when we depart from God's yeah. creational intent, there are no limits to how far and how depraved mm -hmm. the human heart will become, all the while de convincing ourselves that we're actually okay. I'm a moderately decent dude. Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. I'm better than those guys in the town that I grew up in. Correct. And, and At that's, least I'm not like them. And this idea of in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Like, this is what we do. And, Correct. and we can go pretty deep and pretty dark. She then goes into um, this great section at the end on parenting. And I'm just going to invite you to read the last couple pages on your own. Um, she's already made some really great positive statements about parenting in the uh, chapter. She's already been talking about it in the Abraham and Canaan chapter. And some of the same stuff here, some of the same material, but a lot of it's just example setting and setting a code of godly conduct and establishing that altar in your home where you are not an example in unrighteousness, but an example in righteousness to yeah. your children and to your wife and to your husband. Yeah. There's one point I want to draw here in the yeah, last anything. Six, page 203. It's the second paragraph. It's 169. 203? Yeah, 169 of the original version. She says, we. Oh, I like the way that sounds. Page 203. We're already on page 200. Yo. Woo! So she makes this, because some people say, we use this idea of like, well, I know it's a dangerous place. And this is a, a, conviction, a convicting thought for me. That some people will say, well, you know, I know it's a gnarly place, but God needs missionaries there. And I think this is such an important point. That just because God calls people to environments like that does not mean that God called you to that environment. Woo! Come on now. And it needs to be clearly a call Correct. from God that you, you were to be in that environment. So some people say, I know the city's rough, but God needs missionaries there. But has God called you there? So this yeah, is what she says. Great point. We may be placed in trying positions. For many cannot have their surroundings what they would. And then she says it in another place. It's not in this book. It's in a different book. But the way I remember it is that she says, but when God does call to this, to this environment, we should be doubly watchful and prayerful that through the grace of Christ, we may stand uncorrupted. Mm. So for those to whom the call is given, you should be doubly self-distrustful and doubly prayerful before even setting foot in a God-forsaken place like that. Mm. So we can't you need just, to be sure it's from the Lord. We can't just saying. spiritualize away and say, God needs missionaries there. If that is not your specific calling, you're not to be there, period. And because there's such great consequences for your whole family, even if you have a devotional life, your children are not emotionally and spiritually and intellectually developed enough to handle an environment like that. I, I saw somebody in the, in the chat say, they're criticizing a righteous man. It's like, no, we were making the observations that the text itself is making. I mean, yeah. clearly... Moses in Genesis 19 is not painting Lot in anything resembling a favor favorable light. His own hesitancy and delay caused his the wife. death of his wife. Yeah. And 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 caused him to lose his children. I mean, yeah. he was a righteous man. The Bible actually says that in 2 Peter, yeah. that his righteous soul was vexed day by day. <laughs> so he started off in A, but by the time we get to him in this story, he's not still residing. He's not anchored to A. No. He's drifted to C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And she says that repeatedly in this chapter. Yeah, that's not a yeah. criticism of a righteous man. No. It's allowing the text. The, the Bible is not, as we've already said, hagiography. It's not right. telling these glowing stories of no faults mm -hmm. and no dramas and no inconsistencies and no hypocrisies among Many of the major protagonists. I mean, think of David. We're going to get to David. Yeah. I mean, David was a bad dude in a lot of ways and a really great dude in a lot of other ways. Yeah. And yet the Bible says, here's the truth about David. And when we note the truth about David, that's not criticizing. That's just allowing the text to say, 
what the text says about David or even mm. about Moses or about, in this case, Lot. And it's this difference that you've alluded to already, this difference between prescriptive and descriptive texts. Right. The book of Judges is largely just a descriptive text. There's hardly any <laughs> prescriptions on how to do life. Right. Uh, there's a somewhat higher than low lights, but it's not that pretty. This is what happens. So this is the true human condition, which gives us hope that if God even used broken people like that to Come be a light when they should have been there in the first place, there is a glimmer of hope. Phew! The very fact that God used this man in a place he never should have been to be some glimmer of light before these people lost their chance is a sign of God's mercy. Amen. But it's not how you should live your life, and we need to be okay with that. And how about this one? I'll even go so far as to say that it's entirely possible, perhaps even likely, that Lot repented of his poor decision-making, his bad example, and his hesitancy, and is saved. Yeah. And is saved. I have no problem yeah. with that. Okay. There's going to be a lot of people that make historically bad and serially bad decisions, a la the thief on the cross, right. throughout their entire life. And yet, those people can turn to Jesus, they can plead with him, and the blood of Jesus can cover them, and they can be saved. But it doesn't mean that their life was not one giant catastrophe. Yeah, and that brings me back to that statement from Faith and Works we talked about, page 45, I think we talked about yesterday, that when God lets man have his own way, it's the darkest hour of yeah, his life. Yeah, great point. And that's what happened to him. God on, let man. him have what he wanted. And though it was dark, God still in his mercy went into that city, grabbed him by the, the fluff of the neck and right. yanked him out of there, kicking yeah, 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 and screaming yeah, 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 yeah. because he loved him and wanted him. Amen. Um, she closed, there's that great text in Jude that says that. Yeah. Of some take compassion, making a difference, and others pull with fear out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That's, that's right. what the angels do here in this story. They basically go in there, they grab Lot by the scruff of the neck, and they drag him out. That's it. And so... Um, the fulfillment of God's promises may seem to be long delayed, she says. For with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand is one day. This is the last page here, top mm. paragraph. And it may appear to delay, but at the appointed time it will surely come, it will not tarry. She uses this word, kind of laces it throughout in different contexts. So he delayed and lost his wife. God delayed judgment and giving it to the city. Mm. He's asking, he's tarrying, she's lost. But he's also delaying because God doesn't want anybody to be lost. Beautiful. Um, and I think that that kind of thread walks around here. She talks about the contrast between Abraham and Lot, Abraham having this simple life. Um, yeah, we covered that. But yeah, that's pretty much Okay, so can I, I'm going to get to the rubric. Let's do it. Because we've already gone about an hour, actually a yeah. little more than. So I'm going to go through the rubric. Um, this is where we go through the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. And uh, D, I'll just kind of go through mine. And if you okay. want to riff off of anything, you sure. let me know. So for me, the point of this chapter is actually pretty straightforward. Here's what I wrote. To tell the tragic tale of the destruction of Sodom and of Lot's family's rescue, and to make important and urgent applications to the modern reader. And then for me, the point of application is to flee, flee, flee from sin and from, and I purposely wanted to use this word, vexatious sinners. <laughs> vexatious. Yeah. I looked yeah. it up. It's actually a word. Right. Because it says that, that Lot's righteous soul was vexed. Mm -hmm. It was annoyed. It was tormented day by day. And so we should not only be fleeing from sin, but to the degree that we're spending time with vexatious sinners and the influence is flowing to us rather than from us, yeah. we should flee. Yeah. Right? We should flee. And, yeah. and this was sort of my takeaway. That yeah. was my point. What do you got? For me, the point is to try to live a righteous life while being comfortable in the presence of foolishness is dangerous. A recipe for disaster. Yeah. Okay, now what do we learn about the person of God here? And I wrote a couple things. I wrote that God takes our free will and our decisions, even our consistently poor decisions, seriously. Yeah. He pleads, he urges, he seeks to rescue, but he cannot and will not force us. Yeah. And that's what we see here. To yeah. the degree that it was possible for Lot to be saved, he was saved. I mean, if a, if another day or two or three or week or more had tarried, Lot himself might have been laughing at the angels. They yeah. just literally snuck in there in the nick of time. Yeah. And uh, we just have to hear the pleadings and wooings of the Almighty. I would just add that God's willingness to hear and answer Abraham's prayers also bears fruit here. Um, that God is, is clearly hearing the desperate prayers of those who have a concern for drifting and lost children. Amen. Thank yeah. you, Jesus. And it's never too late. I mean, yeah. as, long as, there's, as long as there's breath in the lungs and blood in the heart that's yeah. pulsating through the heart, people can still turn. You might be nailed yeah. to a, 
a wooden cross and terrified of what the future holds. And you can still turn to Jesus and say, Lord, Amen. remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's Amen. never too late. Amen. Okay, then uh, how do we pray this chapter? Here's what I wrote. God save me from the sensuality of this age and from the idleness and laziness and ease that creates the soil from which ungodly sensuality grows and help me. Help me to be a parent like Abraham and not like Lot. Mm. You know, she does yeah. She does make at least three unambiguous references to the sensuality of Sodom. Yeah. And the Sodom comes up actually quite a lot in the New Testament. Matthew yeah. 10, Matthew 11, Mark 6, Luke 10, Luke 17, Romans 9, 1 Timothy 1, 2 Peter 2, which we've quoted. Jude, Jude yeah. uh, 1 verse 7 and Revelation 11. Yeah. Uh, Sodom, rather, is used as an example again and again and again of a kind of particularly perverse sensuality and sexuality that is detached from God's creational moorings. Yeah. There's no question about that. And uh, particularly what's on display here in Sodom is this, this desire to gang rape these men. And uh, it was just so perverse and so disgusting. She, she describes it in very, I would say, modest but honest language. Mm -hmm. And yeah, God, we live in the most sensual world, the most sensual time, I think, in human history. Yeah. And if we don't actively pray, and I've told my teenage boys this, well, I've now a 20-year-old, but I've told my boys over and over again, you have to pray for protection mm -hmm. from the sort of ambient, atmospheric sensuality of this yes. age because you can't avoid it. Yeah, it is everywhere. everywhere. If you have a smartphone, it's there. If you have a television, it's there. If, you're if you have a car, car, you drive down, it's there. It's yeah. there. You can't avoid it. So what we have to pray for is, and this is not just for the men, this is for the women too. Yeah. We have to pray for protection mm -hmm. because all of these invitations and all of these allurements are trying to tempt us away from God's ideal for human sexuality. God loves yeah. sex. Yeah. He created sex. He celebrates sex. But when we're unmoored from God's intent in human sexuality, we can get drawn into things that will eventually destroy us yeah. and kill us. Um, so God save me. That's it. And, and God burn every bridge of sympathy in my heart for the things that killed Jesus. Yes. Um, Amen. Whatever Thank they are, well burn said. those bridges. Yeah. Um, how do we practice this chapter? Here's what I wrote. I want to make decisions that are good for my soul and my family not just decisions that are good for my wealth, my ease, and my temporal prosperity. Absolutely. And that's the mistake that Lot made. Yeah, for sure. I, I, would, I would second that, that. To not sacrifice my principles for temporary gain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, somebody, I just saw somebody mention, what's that really weird verse in Genesis 19? I almost oh, yeah. forgot it. Look, Take a look at this. Genesis chapter 19. This is so interesting. And if, if, you, if you don't read it carefully, you could easily miss this. And uh, I, I, I'll never forget, several years ago, I was on a plane with a, a dear uh, Jehovah's Witness, and we just ended up sitting next to one another. We got to chatting, and he found out that I was a, a minister of the gospel, and he told me he was a Jehovah's Witness, and, you know, invariably, he wanted to start right into a conversation about the Trinity, and I was like, <laughs> okay, you know, of yeah. course, and it was like a three-hour plane ride, and, and uh, I remember going to Genesis 18 and 19, because he had a question about... Yeah. Jehovah, there's only one Jehovah. And I said, well, yeah. let, me show you, let me show you a verse. To Yahweh, yeah. so, so we went, we read through, all the way through Genesis 18, where Abraham sees the three way, wayfaring travelers, and he goes out and he invites them in, and they have a little cheese, and they wash their feet. And then the two leave, and I, I just walked them through. Okay, now who are those two? And yeah, those two are the angels. I said, okay, so far so good. And then, and then who stays back and, and talks with with Abraham, he said, yeah, that's Je Jehovah. You know, this, yeah. I'm, I'm talking to him on the plane. Yeah. yeah, that's Jehovah. And he's negotiating 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Yeah, so far, so good. Yep. So then the two angels arrive. Yeah, and the whole story that we've just gone over tonight. And he's just tracking with me every step of the way. We're just reading through the text. It was really enjoyable. And then we got to, um, let's just start in verse 20. So Genesis 19, verse 20. And um, this is now Lot pleading to Jesus, the third traveler, because you have to remember, just as Lot is brought out by the two angels that had arrived earlier, Jesus now, who was delayed because of his intercession with Abraham, he arrives late to the scene. Yeah. So he's standing outside of the city, and here comes Lot outside. Now watch this. Verse 20, Lot says, look now, this city is near enough to flee to. It's a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one and my soul will live? And he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this also. 
in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Okay? Hurry, verse 22, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of that city was called Zoar. Verse 23, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Now look at verse 24. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Verse 24 says, Then the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's Yahweh, that's Jehovah. So I'm just going to insert that. And when we were reading through this, it was so great. I said, okay, so what does that say there? And, and he had his kingdom translation there. And so it said Jehovah. So it says, then Jehovah reigned brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from, from Jehovah, Jehovah out of the heavens. And I simply said to him, how many Jehovahs are there in that verse? And he just is like, um, um, I really, I, I have work I have to do. I've got a lot of work. I've got a meeting when I land. <laughs> I think my mom's calling. I got to go. Because we had clearly established <laughs> yeah. that the, the man that was with Abraham at his tent in the yeah. negotiation process, that's Jehovah. Yeah. There's no, and he's like, yeah, that's Jehovah. Of course, that's Jehovah. It's clearly in the context, Jehovah. And then Jehovah shows up late to, to Sodom. And when Lot comes out, he says, hey, I want to go to Zohar. He says, no problem. And when Lot goes into Zohar and the sun comes up, it says Jehovah. Well, which Jehovah? The Jehovah right there, the one that's standing just outside of the perimeter of the city of Sodom, rained fire and brimstone from Jehovah, where? Out of the heavens. Now, this is not difficult for us because we've already been introduced right. in numerous passages in Genesis to the fact that God, Jehovah, is a plurality. Let yeah. us make man in our image uh, after our likeness. And we also saw in the Tower of Babel there, come let, let us. us go mm -hmm. down. So we're already mm -hmm. introduced. And the, the word Elohim is, of course, itself right. uh, a plural. Yeah. So, so when you have a Jehovah here raining down fire and brimstone from a Jehovah out of the heavens... It's a fascinating passage that is not easy to get around if you're going to try and rigidly deny the internal unity and plurality of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's a great little passage. I mentioned that at the beginning and I, I didn't want to forget it. So hopefully you I've been using that, that for 11 years since you taught that at Arise. Isn't that a great one? I have two Yahwehs underlined in my text. Yeah, that's right. It's your fault. Yahweh rains fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of the heavens. Okay, now my Bible promise was, um, my Bible promise was a text, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 25, where God says, I will contend with him mm. that contends with you, and I will save your children. Mm. And I cling to that promise. Now, just, there are conditions within that promise, yeah. right? God says, I will contend with him that contends with you. Well, God can only fight with the one that's fighting with me if something's fighting against me, right? When, when, when Lot made a series of really ill-advised decisions, yeah. Satan wasn't fighting with him on those decisions. He was right. encouraging him along, pushing right. him along. So God can only be true to this prayer. I will contend with him that contends with you, or I will war with him that wars with you, and I will save your children. If we are placing our family and ourselves in a situation where Satan is warring against us, mm. because there are a great many people on earth whom Satan has infiltrated and is influencing, who he is not warring with, He's building up. He's blessing. He's prospering. I want to be someone that the kingdom of darkness is warring against, mm. is contending with. And so I'm clinging to this promise for myself, for my wife, for my two sons, and for our extended family. I will contend with him that contends with you, and I will save your children. That's my promise. You got Amen. one, Dee? Yeah, another promise uh, of intercession for those who are lost and that trouble you. Jeremiah 31, 16 to 17. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, Ew. says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says Amen. the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. I love that. Um, that's, that's one of the great promises, Jeremiah 31. 31, 16 to 17. That's a promise for those who are drifting that you're praying for and, and hoping for. Okay, we're right down here at the end, and we want to see what What's your word, word is that encapsulates this chapter. This is a... A varied chapter. I think there's a lot of words that could work here. As I already yeah. mentioned, I think the word limit, yeah. if I hadn't already used it, is a great word. Yeah. I want to see what you guys have got here. Oh, the very first Please. person, that's my word. Whoa. That is also my word. Landry, Christy Landry, that's my word. Yo. Flee. All right. What do we got? Mercy. Influence. influence. We used that one before. Well, I did. 
Uh, Beautiful oh, limits. limits. There you go. Luxury. Yep. Delayed. Okay. Is that your word? Delay slash because I, I or, okay. or hesitate. Hesitate or delay. I'll okay, that's one. good. Check. Influence. Escape. Ooh, escape. M Marco, I like that. that rescued. That captures the same idea. Ooh, I like rescued. Out. Great word, Melba. Ruth. Because God can redeem even our darkest. Okay, that's that's interesting. Influence. Influence. Escape. Yeah. Priorities. Oh, another right, out. Oh yeah, that's excellent, Christy. Very yeah. good priorities. Another limit. Hesitancy. Hesitancy. Yeah. Consequences. That's a big one. Very good. Hey, Madeline. Great to see you. Say hi to Ray for me. Um, mistake. Boundaries. Boundary. Self-seeking. Yeah, because she talks about how his yeah. decisions were self-seeking and contrast them with Abraham, who's selfless. Yeah, that's very yeah. good. Oh, pilgrims. That's good. Choice. Choice. Another Exodus. hesitation. Yeah. Exodus, very similar to my word. Mine was flee. Michelle says separate. Great word, Michelle. Judgment. Oh, strangers. strangers. Oh, that's actually kind of cool because of yeah. the double meaning, the strangers yeah. that came yeah. and how we're called to be strangers. Ooh, yeah. Naomi, I like that. Yeah. I really like that. Hardened. Mm. Yeah, that's not wrong. Intercessor. Reiner says out. Yeah, intercessor. Contrast. Okay, Jim says, I went to I went to high school with Nitro. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, so great. That's Jim, great. that's good. Here. Really cool story, actually. Wow. We went to high school together. We we didn't know one we were friends. We weren't close friends. We knew one another. And then he became aware that I had become a preacher and he started watching a bunch of my sermons. And amazing. Whoa. And another guy that we both went to high school with who was like the the jock in the school, one of the coolest guys. Do you know Ginger White? Yeah. So it's it's her brother, Michael Jones. No way. Yeah, we all three went to high school together. Really nice. cool. Stevens High School in Rapid City, South Dakota. Hurry. Salt. Yeah. F okay, flee sin, flee the world. You know, one of the reasons I chose the word flee is that the Apostle Paul, writing to young Timothy in yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee from says lusts. flee from youthful lusts. And then right in the Genesis story, we're going to see this opportunity for Jacob in Genesis 39 That's to right. flee from Potiphar's wife. Yeah. And and Joseph, yeah. Joseph, thank you. Joseph flees. What did I say? Jacob. Jacob. Joseph flees, and, and we see in the text that the angels are literally saying, flee, get yeah. up, hurry, yeah. flee, flee, get out of here. Yeah. And you, I love what you said. Well, you know, we need to have a garage sale. Right. And, you know, well, you know you're right. We'll, take we'll some stuff down that. to Goodwill. Yeah. And, you know, but it's like, no, your life right is now. in danger. Flee. Yeah. Get out. And, and what I wrote here is that uh, the, the fleeing is contrasted with the opening paragraph's emphasis on idleness, mm -hmm. right? To be idle is just to be stationary, yeah. to sit, to just be kind of lazy. Yeah. And that fleeing, that urgency to get out is contrasted with the opening idleness that she describes. So, all right, everybody, that was super, I mean, I don't want to say enjoyable because it's it's a tough passage, but it's a reminder to us that our decisions have consequences mm -hmm. and sin is not to be trifled with. You sometimes mm -hmm. hear people say, God is not to be trifled with. Okay, fair enough. But the thing that's going to kill you is sin. Yeah. And right. she says that. That's trifling. That's exactly right. She uses that exact language. Okay. Yeah. So thank you all for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. What's our chapter tomorrow? Uh, oh, uh, the Isaac marriage of Isaac. Yeah. And by the way, just a word on this. It is purposeful, I believe, to contrast the grotesque sensuality of Genesis 19, both in the desired gang rape and in the offering of Lot's virgin daughters and in the decision that Lot's daughters make yeah. to take, because she talks about that, yeah. to lie with their dad, all of that unmoored, perverse, anti-creational sexual expression. And then what's the very next chapter? Yeah. This beautiful, chaste, godly, faith-filled, yeah affirmation of human marriage and sexuality. It's a yeah. purposeful contrast and juxtaposition. Yeah. So that'll be a good one. Mm -hmm. That'll be a good one to talk about tomorrow. So did I pray or did you pray to it's start? It's your turn. Okay, I'll pray. Let's yep. pray together. Father in heaven, this has been a, a really good I, and I think important mm -hmm. conversation. Father, we live in a world that is just run amok with sensuality, with evil. And Father, if we get our bearings from the world around us, if we're if we're gauging where we're at relative to the world around us, Father, we could find ourselves in a very precarious and dangerous situation. 
Father, help us to be getting our moorings from the text of Scripture, yes. from, from what your word says, and to be orienting ourselves back to that Edenic ideal. Amen. Father, we look back to Eden, and according to Revelation 21 to 22, we look forward to Eden. Mm -hmm. And so help us to, even in our day-to-day -day lives, be leaning in to how you've made us, that creational intent that you had. And Father, we don't do these things, of course, in order to woo or to invite or to, to lay hold of your favor. We do these things because we have your favor in Christ. Mm -hmm. And that in Christ, you call us to a higher and holier and happier way of living. And so, Father, help us not to end up at the end of our lives broken and filled with mountains of regret, um, drinking our lives away in despondency. Father, help us to go from strength to strength, from glory to glory, and just see that the path that you have for us is far better than any path we would choose for ourselves. And the place that you have for us mm -hmm. is far better than any place we would choose for ourselves. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.